All right, let's give the Lord a hand. Try to get this energy up with one screen. So my wife and I were talking this week because uh, this August will make 10 years since we first came to the church. And we're thinking like, wow, how fast did that go? So Hannah was like 10. Now these kids are off running around. So there's a lot of things I was thinking about this, and there's a lot of things that we learned over the years. And um, one of those things is every time we're, you're reading the word, you're listening to sermons, you're uh, reading band, at least this is the way I used to think, but when you first came here, you would read it, especially if it was something bad, you'd be thinking, oh, that's not for me, that, that must be for somebody else. But in reality, all of it is for us. And that's actually could be a good thing because as time goes on over the 10 years, you can kind of go in and out of different times of your life. Amen? So sometimes things will go smooth. They're going good. You're being blessed. Other times you're being uh, corrected. There's some kind of instruction. So that's where the challenge comes, right? So all of it's for us. It's our daily walk. It's everything that we we do on a daily basis. And I come to realize that even though sometimes you're reading and you're listening to a sermon, sometimes it doesn't always make complete sense. And you know what? It's almost, it's not going to always be like that. It's not going to always come with full understanding. So God's good because that's why we read the Bible over and over. Sometimes you'll read, does it make sense? You'll go back and all of a sudden, bam, there's like a light bulb, right? It just goes off. And uh, actually, this has been an interesting couple of weeks. Um, there's just so much going on. And this thing, what I'm talking about today, has actually tested me, too, because it was just, a, it's been crazy. It's uh, my, my company that uh, Bishop Kim, um, he said, go lower and take this job. And I did, and things worked out pretty good. But uh, we started with 140 banks. We cleaned the banks. Our company cleans them. Well, right now they merged, U.S. Bank merged with Union Bank. So when they did that, a lot of those banks had other banks right across the street. So they ended up merging and closing 40 of our banks in the last. We actually got the word like two weeks ago, like on a Wednesday, and said, next Friday um, you need to be getting rid of X amount of banks, like 20. So we did that. We're changing routes. We're doing all this stuff, just all this chaos. It was going crazy. And then as it went further, they said there's 20 more banks. So it was just, it's been crazy. Everybody's, it's been hectic. Everybody's stressed out. It was definitely testing me because, you know, this is our livelihood, of course, but it doesn't really affect my job. But I had, I had a really, it was kind of stressful because you have to tell a lot of people that they're not going to have their job anymore. So it was kind of bad. Um, even with something like that, um, just last Friday, uh, we're going to be starting service, and then my dad calls me and says, I'm at Costco right now in Union City, and I came out to my truck, and somebody actually tried to steal my catalytic converter. So it's just hanging there, right? And, and then he realized, and my dad, he's like 84, right? So he's out there. It's like the end, almost the closing time, and I'm here, so he's like blowing my phone up. And um, he's asking me about it. So he calls AAA, and the, the people that were trying to steal the catalytic converter, and as you know, they're really expensive. I looked it up. They're like up to 1200 bucks for a catalytic converter. So that's why these thieves are taking them and selling them, you know, on the street. So anyways, he goes out to his car. He has his groceries. And uh, next door, there's a van there. And he said there's like these real kind of shady people. And he says he realized they were the ones who were stealing his stuff. So when he said, uh, when he looked and said, like, hey, what's going on here? The guys got in the van and they took off. So anyways, he calls me like, I don't know, I think well, Costco closes at 8.30. And he calls me like at 6. He goes, yeah, I called AAA. They should be here in like um, one hour. So I said, okay, yeah, Dad, just kind of hang out there. You're good, right? You had your groceries. And he said the security people were helping him there at Costco. And then he calls me like two and a half hours, two and a half hours later. He said, um, they haven't come yet. And I'm like, so it's like, I'm thinking like, that's what happens, right? So when you're going through things, 
it's not just one thing. It's going to be one thing after another. So there's, it's been that kind of week. It's been really cra- crazy, um, and it really was making sense of what I feel like God was giving me to talk about today. At first, honestly, I didn't understand it, but let me just go into it. So I don't know if you guys read the Health and Fitness Band. Um, it's the one where I put something about walking. So uh, I listened to Dr. Berg, and Dr. Berg is one of those guys. He, he's a doctor, but he's like a fitness guy too. So he has some pretty good tips. And he's talking about walking and all the benefits. So I kind of list that on there. And um, I don't know if you noticed, if you guys read it, Pastor Eugen put up, she put a comment in there that said, hey, that's pretty good, but I'm going to add something on here about posture. So posture in the physical means like when you're walking, right? You know, you don't want to be slumping over because she says that can make, and she put some videos, so it can make things worse, she said. It can put stress on your knees. If you watch the video, it can hurt your back. So I thought, oh, that's pretty good. So in the physical, they made a lot of sense because walking is, you know, it's, it's healthy. It's healthy for your mind, for your body. And then the posture is what you, um, your position. So posture is position. I have the, uh, the description up here, the meaning. So let's pull up a little bit more, number three. I'm used to being on that side. So it's a conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. And that was pretty interesting because what I'm talking about today was attitude. So what Pastor Eugene put something in the physical, which made a lot of sense to our physical walk, then, of course, we start thinking, well, what about the spiritual? So spiritual, spiritually, we all have a walk, right? We're here. We always talk about your Christian walk. And what God was giving me is about how our Christian walk relates to our attitude. So when Pastor Eugen put that thing on there, I thought, hey, wait a minute. We got something here. So I was laughing with my wife because when we grew up, I don't know if you guys remember that game when you were a kid, and it's called um, the concent- it's called concentration, or you would all those little cards would be face down. There'd be like 20 cards, and you turn one over, and it has like a you know, little apple, and you turn over another one, and it has like a pineapple, right? So that doesn't match. But then later... You start bringing, you turn them over, and you realize, hey, there's a match here. That's what this was like. And I was like, hey, that's kind of exciting. So I was getting a lot of, uh, getting a lot of um, revelation here, and I was thinking, wow, this is kind of cool. Something kind of naturally came over what Pastor Eugen put. Actually was speaking to me in the spiritual. So a conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. So I don't know if you guys know this, but years ago, I used to be a fitness trainer um, when I was in school. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things they talk about in, in fitness, too. There's, uh, there's things that you can measure and things that you cannot measure. So, like, you can work out, you can eat right and have your program and do all these things. But a lot of times during this, um, this fitness walk that you're doing, you have to have a good attitude about that. You have to, because they're finding a lot of people get into this new area called, um, you know, it actually starts dealing with the mind and why people are not getting results in the mind, right? Because it's their attitude. So I just remember a lot of this was kind of coming to me this week and then plus the stuff with the bank and then my dad was calling me and then he gets really stressed out. He's very impatient, so he'll call me and sometimes I'm here and my phone's blowing up and he's like, he's mad at everybody. He's mad at the AAA guy. And anyway, he ended up getting everything taken care of. It, it took him like three hours to get to him. So he was out there at, um, at Costco, and they finally gave him a ride home. So my poor dad. Another thing I was thinking about, too, was um, about just different times recently where I had to, my attitude was being chest- tested. So, of course, with this thing, and then last week, APC was talking about his arm and what happened. And he was mentioning the word attitude, and I thought it was kind of, it was confirmation because I remember the same thing, and I don't know if you guys remember me talking about where we went skating with the church, and I fell on my arm, and I dislocated my arm, or they, we thought I did, but it just put a little tear in there, but um, I don't, I'm like ABC, I don't like to be hurt, and um, I was thinking, like, I had to go through the whole process of getting an MRI, and 
they find like nothing's wrong and all it was was just some um, inflammation in there. So I was thinking this whole time, it was just really, it was testing my attitude and I wasn't happy. And of course you have to come here and you have to be nice and you have to, you know, you just have to have a good attitude with everything that you do. Amen. So that led me into what I'm talking about tonight. And that is, how's your attitude? So that's what I had to ask myself. How's my attitude? So when you look up the word attitude, it means a feeling or opinion about something. So it's a feeling or opinion about something. So we can be doing our reading, our praying, worship, or obeying. We can get instruction, correction, all the above, right? But this is one of those intangible things. Those things are hard to measure, and it's about your attitude. So I really felt like God was not only showing me this, but he was, like, testing me, too. And it was, you know, I had a very stressed two weeks. It's, it's been crazy. So attitude, it's a renewing of your mind. Can you pull up Ephesians 4? And it's really exciting. I'm sure you guys might have experienced this where you're actually reading and you might be going through something and all of a sudden something just jumps off the page, right? And then all of a sudden, like I said, it's like that concentration game. Things are just like, oh, that's a match. That makes sense here. And now all the dots are beginning to connect. And I think that's what's exciting because you realize all this applies to your life. It's not just reading and coming here and, you know, where nothing may not make sense for a while. But actually, God's good. He does all this for us. He's teaching us, right? So in Ephesians 4, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So even with the, the walk and that post that I put on there, they're talking about the mental and, sp mental and the attitude, but it's, we're talking spiritual here. God thinks the same way. He wants to think the same way. He will show us things in the physical to actually teach us in the spiritual. So sometimes it's hard to get that, especially if we're going too fast, if we're stressed out, if we're not paying attention, or maybe our attitude's bad. We're, we will tend to miss this. So it's always best to kind of slow things down. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, be, like Pastor says, is to go back and re-watch something or re-read something, and, and then it might make sense. God may be speaking to us. Amen. So I put on here, an attitude is something that is hard to measure. It's intangible. It's, we don't really talk about that in church. It's always like spiritual things, right? But your attitude is very important because it's like having a car and everything's there. But if you have the wrong mental attitude, you may not have gas in your car. So you're not going to go anywhere. So a lot of times we come to church, we're praying, reading, crying out in worship, praying, um, uh, you know, reading the word, shouting, but you can even come here, and I've done this too in the past, where you come here and you're just kind of in a bad mood, or you had a rough week, or you're exhausted, and you don't want to be bothered by somebody, but that's our attitude. God is constantly watching us what we're doing, and even like, I like the, we're on the kids post right now, the kids band post, and the youth, and they're always talking about things, like God's watching you, and it's like what we're talking about here, so they're right. It's kind of cool. So the Bible asks us to have an attitude like Jesus. If you can pull up 1 Peter. We, God always is reminding us what is our attitude like. And I never really caught this. You know, I just, that word attitude would always just kind of fly under the radar, right? But in reality, it's not just spiritual. God is watching. He wants, he puts this stuff in here, all of this for us so we can get this. I, put, I like putting two different versions because sometimes they say a little bit different words with a little change of words. So on this side, um, since Christ suffered and underwent pain, you must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. And I don't know if you guys do this, but sometimes I listen to uh, Bishop Kim or Pastor June's sermons as well as ours. And they're talking about that. They're always talking about... Um, if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to have to suffer. It's a guarantee. So, but what happens when you get that 
When, what happens when you have to suffer like that? What happens when you have to go through that? You have to have a good attitude, and that's what this is talking about here. You must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. For remember, when your body suffers, sin loses its power, and you won't be spending the rest of your life chasing after evil desires, but will be anxious to do the will of God. So there's, got, there's actually a little hint here for us that, you know, sometimes we're trying to overcome our sins, our strongholds, and, you know, we're not able to do it on our own. And, but when what Christ did, what the Lord did, he was determined. He went, and even though he knew he was going to suffer, he had the right attitude. And see, I think when God watches us, he's, if we have the right attitude, then he's going to come for us. He's going to come for us, and he's going to be the one that has the, gives us the power. And then our sin, like it says in one, loses its power. The other version says, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. So that's another key here. We want to make sure our way is not going to be the answer to do this. If not, we wouldn't need the Bible, right? We would need to pray. But if you're going to be weaning from that old sinful habit and getting out of your own way, you're really going to have to go through and understand about what suffering is. Suffering is dying to yourself, killing all that stuff. That so when God's bringing all these these stresses in your life, what happens? Right, we're always told like the the bear comes out, right? And sometimes you just feel it here. You want to you're getting mad. You want to explode on somebody, but you can't. You're going to have to die to that, and that's where God's going to come for you. And if you if you you overcome that by trusting him and letting him come for you. That's how we're going to get through a lot of our sinful habits. Amen? Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. So what you want, it's actually, it can be very stressful. It can be tormenting to you. If you constantly think that you want to do things your way, it's actually a lot of pressure on us. So... It's to our advantage that we want to learn God's way. So if he's putting us through things to suffer, then we just got to go through with a good attitude. I was recently listening to Bishop Kim's sermon, and he's talking about opinions. So here's the opinion meaning, right? A thought or belief about something. So it's very similar to, to the attitude. A thought or belief about something. But he says that if a person comes and you have too many opinions, too many feelings about your way and your things, he said you're basically setting yourself up a pathway for judgment. So you want to make sure, we want to make sure that we're not always trying to think things our way. And that's why we're here, right? You know, we come here, God's really good. I mean, this is like being in school. We've been here 10 years, and we have sermons every week. Um, band, I mean, band is like so great. It just gives you so much um, uh, training and instruction. And, and of course, uh, we have pastors to help us out here. But if we really understand and we get this, less and less of us is going to be prevalent in our lives and it's going to be more of God, right? We're going to be more like him. Can you pull up 2 Corinthians 10? So I've always said before, when I start reading things or uh, researching, I'm really looking, and I ask this, the first thing I ask God is like, can you please make sure that I'm living this too? Because I know a lot of times I don't, and I have lives like everybody else, and I get tired and stressed, and, you know, I think like, what about this God? What about that God? We had a, you know, and then, but you have to, even though you may have that, you have to put that down immediately. Your attitude has to change. So in 2 Corinthians here, it says, first, um, excuse me, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty, what? Opinion, right? So the opinions are up here. It's the mind. So the mind, the attitude, your opinions. It's like what Bishop Kim talked about. The weapons of our warfare, the, the divine power, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. 
So the knowledge of God is the word. It's his instruction. It's the Holy Spirit coming for us, helping us. But if we have opinions and we have bad attitudes, you know, it's going against God. So we're actually, there's going to be a constant fight. So it's going to be, again, to our best advantage that we have to understand what God's trying to teach us here. And he's actually doing us a huge favor. I mean, for us to be here at this church, sometimes we really think about it and we think, wow, this is, he really, I mean, there's only like 100 plus here. And, you know, even our youth has so much understanding and revelation that many of uh, church people that we grew up with, they don't understand. That's how we were. We came lost. And take every thought captive to obey Christ. So the thoughts, again, it's the thoughts, the opinions, the attitude. Those are the things that should be obeying Christ. That's all we have to do. We have to practice this. It's not easy, but it, it takes time. It takes practice. Just like anything else when you go to school, when you're in, in work or you're learning a a game or a sport, you have to learn, right? It takes practice. I put on here, so many times instructions come without understanding. So that's also a test. If you're going to say a pastor gives you an instruction or maybe you're at your work, your boss gives you an instruction. And even for me, we got a call like it was like a Wednesday. And they said, okay, Friday, I want, just to give, I want you to give us all new routes for all your your people because we're losing all these banks. And um, that was like an immediate stressor because I like being organized. You know, I like, um, you know, I like being, you know, everybody likes to have some sort of control, right? But when this came over, I was thinking it automatically sent me to stress. And I'm thinking like the flesh in me was like, man, why are they doing this? What's going on? And our area has one of the biggest areas in the country. We have 140 banks. And, um, you know, they eventually took out 40, so now we have 100. So we had to let some really good people go. So, again, instructions will come without understanding, but, again, God's watching us. It's a test. He's watching our attitude. He's watching my attitude. A few years ago, it must have been about, what, four or five years ago in Mountain House? It was my, it was my turn for correction, my turn for suffering. And... Um, so anyways, we go to Mountain House. We're thinking, oh, this is cool. Wow, it's nice out here. Yeah, right. So when we went out there, um, that's when um, God, through the pastors, started really coming after me, correcting me, sending me instructions. And, uh, you know, I was stubborn. I grew up stubborn. I grew up, you know, with a bad attitude. Um, I didn't understand a lot of things. And I remember I, I got this job. And it wasn't a, it was a really physical job. So I got this job, and I'm working there, right, physically, and then my phone is on me, so it's blowing up all day long, and it's stuff like, what about this? What about that? How come you didn't do this? And why are you doing that? And this and that. So I would come home and see uh, God will use everything. In this case, he was using my wife, even my kids at the time. And they were like, my wife was supposed to correct me, which I did not like. So she was correcting me. Um, we were boxing all the time. And it was my fault. But uh, I didn't think at the time it was my fault. But it, trust me, it was my fault. So anyways, it was, I was really, um, I just had a bad attitude. I was like mad. And then there was times, it was right before the church was uh, renovating here. And I remember it was like one of the worst things. And I would come in here, and then um, the, my wife and all the kids would be called into a meeting. And I'm like not called in the meeting, right? I'm thinking like, what am I, chopped liver here? So anyways, I'm out here like a dope. And they're in there talking. I know they're talking about me. It's the worst feeling ever. So anyway, they're in there talking, and they come out, and no one says nothing. All I know is I go home, and I feel like, in my mind, I'm being attacked, right? So, like, you know, the kids were even questioning me. But, see, there was a lot of things that, I had to get out of me. God wanted to get these thoughts and these strongholds and these sins out of me. So he had to have all this pressure come. And, like, all this pressure just was coming up. And I was, like, angry. And I was thinking, like, I think I was supposed to come to church to be peaceful, not more angry. So anyway, as time went on, um, I realized that if, if, 
if I really love God, because I know he loves me, that I was going to have to really push down all of my old ways, my sinful ways, right? So when I did that, I realized that it was to my advantage that God was teaching me through my wife and kids. And uh, as we move forward, I realized that's, that's when, like, you'll, you'll kind of go through your time where you feel like, you know, who is God? And, and during that time in Mountain House, when I had this job, I used to drive, like, 5 o'clock in the morning, like Deacon Jr. over here. He leaves at the crack of dawn. But, um, yeah, it's like when you're driving and, and you know, like, that's where I felt that God was really real to me. I was actually on my way to work, and I'd be crying. I'd be, I was frustrated. I was crying. I was thinking, like, what am I doing here? You, all these thoughts come to my, to my mind, and I have a bad attitude. But as time went on, I realized I actually got more quiet. I got more peaceful. And, you know, a lot of times when we come here, we think, like, we need to be out shouting all the time and being in every conversation you don't. Sometimes there is a time where you have to go, and you have to go under the radar, and you have to just take care of your business. And uh, that's what I did. And God really worked with me, and he, um, it was not anything that I even physically try to do. It's something he did from the inside. I just got this inner quietness and peacefulness. So it was really end up being a good time. And then we end up moving over here. So God was really working with me on that. I put on here the bear had to come out. So all you know when, when you're being tested and you're being corrected and disciplined, you're going to have that bear. When that bear comes to the surface, you have to kill it, right? So it's not good at the time, but... Trust me, of your attitude, if you get this, then you realize that that's when God comes, becomes real to you. Amen? So it's how I was acting with others. Um, was I, re- I was asking myself all these questions. Was I receiving all the instructions? Um, at first, I wasn't, but after, our, I knew I had to. Can you pull up Hebrews 4.12? I put on here, the word of God must be used to fight ourselves. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. See, so we're very lucky here. We have the word. That's what the word's going to do for us. It's going to divide the bad stuff from the good. And like it says on there, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. I think if we really understand that, and we really just kind of go with the flow of that, we're going to be okay with God. A couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with Pastor, and we're kind of, we're talking about something like that. And he said something really profound to me. He said, you know, no matter what happens to me in my life, I realize that even if I didn't have this or I didn't have that, because I know I have God, I'm going to be okay. And he was right. And that thing was just like pierced me. And I thought, yeah, that just, man, that makes a lot of sense. So I've been really trying to hang on to that. You know, I feel like the Holy Spirit, you know, obviously worked through him, but it was actually working through me, especially during this time of, of uh, this challenging time. Recently, uh, my wife and I, we watched that movie, Hacksaw Ridge. That's the one with that. That guy, that seven-day Adventist, I don't know if you guys seen that movie. I think Joshua hates that movie. <laughs> but um, it's when the guy, he's in war, right? And he believes that you shouldn't be carrying a gun. So he wanted to go and, and enlist, but he wanted to go in as a medic. And it's a true story. And uh, anyway, he goes in there. He never carries a gun. They, they gave him a really hard time. They beat him up. Um, they were they're trying to court-martial him. And... At the end, when there was this big O in one of the wars, he went up there and saved 75 men, like in the middle of the night, with no weapons, no guns, and he just did it as a medic. He would help people, and he ended up, it ended up being this big, big story. It was kind of cool. We had watched it before, but I seemed like it kind of, I appreciate it a little bit more this time. Can you pull up Revelation 16?
Then the, I put this on here because when I say that we're here and God gives us so much, this is about how bad, if you let it, this is how bad it can get. This is in Revelation. I just finished the end of this part of the Bible. Then the fourth angel poured out his flask upon the sun, causing it to scorch all men with its fire. Everyone was burned by the blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God who sent the plagues. So there's all this judgment going on, right? Then they did not change their mind and attitude to, to give him glory. So even until the bitter end, these people still kept their mind and attitude. We cannot be like that. We don't want to end up like that. We want to end up where God will come for us. He will show us something new, and all the promises he gives us, which are true, will, he'll come for us. So I just, when I read that, I thought, wow, even to the bitter end, you know, sometimes we can be so stubborn. So this is very interesting. I think you guys are going to find this huge revelation. Actually, can you pull the, the thing up about the goat and the sheep? I'm kidding about the huge revelation. But, okay, so um, there's a guy who did a study on the sheep. And that's what he does. He studies and he did this research on goats and sheep. And in that sermon I was listening to with Bishop Kim, he was talking about the goats and sheep and what happens to you, what can happen to you. So on the left side, this is the sheep, right? Reputation for being worthless misfits. I put misfits, but for being worthless. So just like us, we came here and we're a bunch of misfits, right? So we come here, we don't know what's going on, we don't know what we're doing, but we're the sheep. The goats, reputation for being opinionated, having their own minds stubborn. Okay, on the sheep, defenseless, depends solely on the shepherd and know his voice. It's pretty incredible. As the, the shepherd speaks, they know who he is and they will follow. That's all they do. They just follow and depend on him. The goats, reputation for being independent and curious. Goats have a spirit of defiance, self-will. And my wife and I were laughing. She wanted me to put a video, but it's like this goat. He's like butting everything. He's like, he's a baby too. He's like butting the fence, the horse. A sheep is led by the shepherd. A goat herd, which is one who leads the goat, is led by his goat. So see, it's opposite. So the sheep follow the shepherd, and then the, the goat herd follows the goats. Out of, it's out of order. A goat doesn't follow anyone. A herd of goats goes where it wants, and the goat herd follows behind him. So we're always told, you know, even as parents, you know, or even like my spouse. So if our kids or our, our spouse is out of line, it's our job in love to help them, to correct them, to tell them no, to change that. We have, because if we follow that and we submit to that wrong authority, we can be in trouble. So, you know, those of you who have kids or as your kids get older, keep that in mind because the kids are going to be always testing things, always trying things. And sometimes you just have to say, no, um, God is a God of order. And the last one, shepherds protect sheep from their environment. So the sheep are very innocent. They're defenseless. So the shepherds have to put them in a place where they're going to be protected. The goats, the goat herd protect the environment from their goats. So they have to put the, it's kind of weird, they have to put the goat in a place where it's protecting the things and people around them, right? Because the goats are so out of control. A goat cannot be, and this is it's crazy, a goat cannot be put in a stall with a horse because the goat will eat the horse's tail and his hooves. So that's how defiant they are. And I just remember, like, Growing up, one of my aunts lived in Texas, and um, they had a goat, and he would eat, like, tin cans, and he would be eating, like, everything. But they said, like, a lot of times the goats, they can actually eat themselves to death. They will not stop. They will stop at nothing. That's how stubborn they are. They will just do whatever they want. So when I was listening to this sermon with Bishop Kim, he was talking about where the scripture talks about one side's the sheep, the other side's the goat. You want to make sure if you think you're a goat, you quickly have to repent and get on the other side of being a sheep. Because I think there are times where 
all of us have been maybe on both sides, but we want to be on the sheep side, right? Okay, so there are ways to improve your attitude. We get them all the time here. So when these tests come, when these tough times come, you can... It, I, I put the first one here, respecting God by his authority. And that's something that I had to learn too. I didn't, um, I didn't truly understand what um, spiritual authority was for sure. And then even with my parents, they would do things and I would just sneak out, right? So... But you respect God. That's one way you can improve your attitude. Put things in order. Follow God and his, his authority. And then just like the goats, if you're put, being put in a position, just go with the flow, right? It says over here that the goats, they graze. I'm um, excuse me, the, uh, the sheep, they graze. Is that in there somewhere? I don't know. Maybe it's on the top. So... Um, yeah, so the sheep, when they eat, they just kind of graze. They go with the flow. They just eat, you know, kind of go as they flow. Where the goats, they go and they're browsing. They're looking for trouble, right? And that's where it says uh, they, will, they, can, uh, they will stop at nothing and eat themselves to death. So goats go after whatever strikes their fancy. They are headstrong, stubborn, and go where they want. You're crazy. I, I was kind of laughing when I was reading this. I remember um, during the coronavirus, I don't know if you guys remember, we weren't here anymore, so a lot of times we had to be at home, and we were, like, watching TV at home and watching the sermons, and it was a challenge. You, uh, for us, we kind of appreciated being here because we're here a lot, and to be at home and, and um, everybody having to be in, at home. But I remember Bishop Kim in his sermon, he said, like, when that was happening, he said a lot of people gave him attitude. Um, like, they were saying, this is not really church. You know, they were, like, talking back to him. But he mentions, like, when the coronavirus came and you're watching the sermon, did you come out? Did you get dressed? Did you shower? Were you really paying attention? Did you still appreciate God and the word? So those are, those are things to look out for. They come very natural. One of the things, and I was asking, like, one of, in that movie in Hacksaw Ridge, there was a time when the guy was up there, and he was saving all these guys, and he was exhausted. He hadn't eaten. It was like, I don't know how he did it. But anyways, God must have just gave him the strength, because he kept saying in the film, just one more, God, just one more, Lord, just one more. And then he would hear a guy, hey, help me. So he'd go over there, and he'd go run and help the guy. And then he just did it, and he saved 75 guys with no weapons. And there was, like, when you see the movie, there was, like, bullets and people flying everywhere. So it's, it was crazy. When I was reading this, when I was doing this, I asked God, wow, this makes a lot of sense. This is great, but is there anything else? Is there one more thing that you want me to know here? Because I just want to make sure that I got, I'm connecting all the dots here, and I'm doing exactly what you want to do here. And um, I believe he spoke to me a couple things here. One of them was about complaining. Complaining is basically a, a best friend to a bad attitude. So if you're complaining, it's a refusal to believe. It's, it's refusing to change your mind. And um, I remember hearing even John Bavere, he says that the Holy Spirit told him, he actually corrected him and told him your attitude was bad because you are, you know, you're complaining and you're not doing it verbally, but you're doing it in your heart. And I think anybody who's been here has been through rough times. You'll do that. We all do that. It's the complaining in here. It's over time, though, through the grace of God that we get that out. We get that out and we don't let that come to throughout our mouth or even hurt somebody else. So anyways, he was talking about complaining. So the complaining could be the enemy of your future. It's, you know, God puts that up there with murder and everything else. Complaining basically tells God, God, I don't believe what you say. I can do a better job. And like these goats, I'm stubborn. I know a better way than you do. So that could be a pretty big problem if um, you may be doing all the other things, the reading, praying, all that stuff. But 
if you have a bad attitude or if you're complaining, you can actually, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin, it can ruin your future. So, through the tough times, God goes after your impurities. It's like gold, right? So even 24 karat gold is 14 karat solid gold and 10, 10 karat um, impurities. So when you put it through the fire, right, all those impurities come out. But you're not going to know that until you're put through that fire. And that's what happened. Even for me, the last couple of weeks, it was like I can even, there was like another level of fire. And I was, it was kind of hard, you know. And I was really having to kind of keep it together because I had to take care of my job. I was writing this. Um, my dad was calling me. And, and then um, just a couple of days ago, well, Hannah had her wisdom teeth taken out. And she was not doing too good. The medicine was too strong for her. They put her on fentanyl. And I've never tried that before, but... Um, that really messed her up. I don't know how people do that. She was like like a zombie. And I'd like carry her, right? And my wife had to help her to the bathroom. And it was just kind of bad. So all these little things, right, going on. And again, you just have to, can't complain, just keep your good attitude. Sarah actually took some funny video. Well, maybe one day we'll see it. So when all these things come, how do we... What's a, way, what's a way that we can learn about the good attitude? And I, I think it was when I was, when I was telling you, when I was in Mountain House and I had that job, one of the things that I did when I said I went under the radar is I had, to, I had to live in the moment. In this moment, what's God showing me right now? You can't take care of the past. It's done. In the future, we don't know the future. So you have to live in the moment right now. Appreciate what you have. It's about being grateful. And that... That's the thing that's going to destroy attitude is your thankfulness. Amen? Because complaining, you'll blame God. But if you're grateful, God will, he's watching you. And he's going to say, you know what? Maybe this person is ready. I can give them this. And it's like, that's what happens to the people with the talents, right? The guy who took care of his business, he just took care of it. He got bored. The one who had, um, he had the bad attitude. He, he went and buried it. He got cast out. So God watches this with the little things, big things and little things. It's not always this big old, you know, all the fireworks. So when pastors give us an instruction through God, through your leadership, through your work, maybe through your spouse, it can come from anywhere. Check your attitude right at that moment. Live in that moment right there and just watch it and just pray that God will give you the wisdom. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what's really in my heart because he will if you do that. You don't think he's going to come for you? The last thing I was going to talk about was when I was talking about where I was asking God, okay, one more, is there one more thing, God? And I clearly heard in my spirit about, I, mean, I was asking, and this was even for myself, that how come some of us don't overcome? We have like, we seem to get, and Pastor put something recently on the band, and he says, you might overcome some things, but there's always that, Last thing, and I'm asking God, how come we don't overcome that? How come, like, what's the problem here? And I don't even know what that is. So I was just kind of meditating on that, and I believe he told me it's the failure to adapt. And so I don't know if um, people who do, people who exercise may understand this too, where say if you're working out or you're going for a walk, and maybe you're just starting and you can only walk I don't know, 10 minutes. So you do the best you can, and then you're tired, you come home, and then you just keep going, right? As you know, your body will keep adapting to what you put it through. It's like your workouts, right? You're, if you're lifting weights and you're lifting 20 pounds, you will get stronger, and then you'll be able to lift 40 pounds. So you just keep going. Otherwise, if you don't change that mode, you're going to, what they call in, in the fitness industry is you're going to plateau, which means you're going to stop growing. You're going to stop moving forward. So people who work out, people who, who have done these things can understand, too, where you have to constantly change. You have to constantly change up your, your workout. And it's kind of the same thing here, too. Like, say if you're, if you're praying at home. And it's just getting a little stale, you're tired, and you're just maybe have too many distractions, come to church. You just 
change it. Change it so your body doesn't plateau, and God will use that. He will, he'll use that, and, and you'll learn. So can you pull up Philippians 4? And this is where Paul is talking about how he adapted to his circumstances. I love this. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So if you know a little bit about Paul, he went through a lot. He had a huge calling. He was jailed, beat up, whipped, I don't know how many times, um, left for dead, um, shipwrecked, and so on. But even through all that, his attitude was good. And I also listed a few other people that had good attitudes. pastor was talking about Daniel. In the Bible, he had a good attitude. He was put through the fire. He still continued to pray. Job had a good attitude. Uh, Joseph had a good attitude. And then, of course, there's the goat side, right? The people with a bad attitude. Uh, Korah uh, was ungrateful and entitled in the, book of number, in the book of Numbers. King Saul, he was jealous. Of, he was afraid of people, and he put people before God. Uh, disobedient. Another person, bad attitude. Esau, he gave away his birthright for a meal. Is that crazy? Judas, he was, he thought that he knew better than what Jesus did, so he betrayed him. Satan, he wanted to be equal with God. So, again, as you can see, the wrong side of the coin, when you don't have the right attitude, how bad this can go for you. These people were just, again, it's in the Bible, and it shows us examples that we can live by this and we can get to where God wants us to be. So we're going to constantly be tested. Pastor always says we have to be professional Christians. That's everywhere. Whether it be at home, church, at the store, working. Um, and what the cool thing is, I realized too that God gave us, he gave us authority. When we became Christians and he went to the cross, he took the authority back and now when we came here, he gave us part of that authority, right? So now if you continue to trust him, learn to die to yourself, all these things, you'll, he will start giving you like the talents a little bit more and a little bit more power and authority as time goes on. But for what reason? It's not for us. It's for somebody else. It's for his purpose. So continue to work toward that. And as you know, with, after the 10th year here, Things have changed. The fire is hotter. The anointing is higher. And the things that we might have done five, ten years ago, they're not going to fly today. So we want to make sure that we have a good attitude, quickly obey, take care of all the little things. But remember, get rid of the opinions and stay with a good attitude. One of the, one of the sermons that Bishop Kim talked about, too, he said he warned about a lot of times, God, if you're getting off track, he will warn you. And if you don't listen to the warning, he's going to tear you. And I was thinking, tear you? So you go and look it up, and tearing means he's going to come and he's going to judge you. He's going to bring a circumstance in your life where he's going to get you to start getting out from the goat side to the sheep side. Why? Because he loves us. It. It's not that he's just this tyrant. He's coming here to help us. That's what the word is for. It's for all of us. So it's our responsibility to have the it's a good attitude, um, press toward the things of God. It may be hard. It's, you're not going to do it on your own. If you think you're going to do it on your own, even through experience, trust me, you're not going to do it. You're going to have to go to God. You're going to have ask him to help you, to show you. And if you mean that, he is going to show you. And this way, some of us get stuck, right? We get stuck. We get caught in that rut. We've been doing this too long. We just don't know how to go to get past this. And one of the things that Pastor June said, that when you're sinning and your sin is not dealt with, like the warning, it now becomes a stronghold. 
And now that it's a stronghold, you cannot do this on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God. So that's where all of us have um, being stuck is almost like the plateaus when you work out. So just work on we all need to keep working toward not just the regular things, reading, praying, worship, obeying, but the attitude. Check the attitude. I believe God was, he really wants to fix that for us so we can do great things for him. Amen? So we need to adapt to a higher way of understanding. It's God's way. Amen.